Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Build Strong podcast. I'm here with my wife, Amber Soli. Hello. Happy to be here. Yes, yes. Uh, Today, we are tackling the subject of parenting. And before we get there, uh, we want to let you know that really this podcast is all about simply adding value to people's lives. Uh, right. We want to have conversations with different people, with each other, uh, about ways that we can add value and lean in. And yeah. we want to let the listeners know you can expect to receive these podcasts usually once a month, the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, sometimes there'll be some special episodes sprinkled in as well. We also want to let you know that if you have questions you'd like us to answer on an upcoming podcast, be sure to send an email to podcast at lifecenter.com. Podcast at lifecenter.com. So today we are going to tackle the conversation around getting purposeful with parenting. So we've been parents now for over 16 years. That's right. Uh, we have three biological kids. Yeah. We've also fostered. Three kids. Three kids. Yeah. And uh, anything you want to say as we begin about parenting? Well, I would say parenting has been our biggest joy probably in life. Also the most challenging, the most room for growth personally and for marriage yeah. growth as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, parenting will definitely reveal what's in you. Yes. Um, and so it's it's a great, uh, great opportunity. And so today we're going to talk about getting purposeful with parenting. The good news is we reached out via social media and we got uh, a few different questions that came in, a handful actually, uh, that we want to tackle those questions and just kind of have a discussion around those. But before we get there... Uh, we want to share, so we are going to tackle seven practices that parents should engage in, and we're going to do this in roughly seven minutes. Right. Do you believe we can do this? I believe. I, I think we it. can do this. Okay. Uh, before we get to the seven, seven practices, though, I think it's important for us to start with this idea that things will happen either by design or by default in your right. parenting. Yeah. I know we've talked about that for years. What does that mean? Things things will either happen by design or by default. What does it mean? It means you have to be intentional. Yeah. Every phase, you have to be intentional or you're not going to grow. You're not going to bear the fruit that you want to. Yeah. So if you're not intentional, um, it's not going to get better. Yeah. And that's why we want to talk about being purposeful. Because I think yeah. a lot of people, um, if they're not careful, they can just approach parenting with, well, what, what happens, what happens. But the reality is you are going to be a parent, whether it's by design, in other words, purposeful or by default, in other words, no plan, no real rhyme or reason. Um, and so I remember the day we got the news. I was both 100% thrilled out of my mind and 100% freaked out. You told me you were pregnant. And I, I was like, excited and scared because man that that responsibility i was going to be a dad we were going to be parents um over the years life has taken on a variety of journeys uh we had three kids yeah three and under yes yeah so when when our third was born our daughter faith judah was still three years old yeah justice is just a few months younger than Judah. Yeah, Justice was two. Yeah. And Faith was a newborn. Yeah, and so um, that was a crazy season. Uh-huh. And yet as our kids have grown, like the elementary years, the middle school years, now we're in the high school years uh, with two of our kids now in high school and our daughter is in smack dab in the middle of middle school. Uh, a lot of fun. So uh, seven practices. We're going to jump through these really quick. Yes. Somebody set a timer. Okay, here we go. We got seven minutes. We'll see how fast we can do this. All right. Uh, Practice number one, family party night. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, that's the idea of being intentional to make even something as simple as dinner special. So maybe once a week it is called family party like our family has done. Yeah. But maybe it's just making dinner every night that you possibly can special. 
Yeah. Yeah. That, that's huge uh, for us. Like if you stop by our house on a Friday night, um, we're probably going to be making pizza. We're probably just going to be chilling with the kids, watching yeah. a movie. It's looked different as they've gotten older. You were sharing with me though, an important stat about kids and having yeah. consistent meals together as a family. Yeah. There's so many stats on the significance of meals with families. So first of all, kids are less likely to have eating disorders, drug addictions, low self-esteem if they're consistently having dinner as a family, right. which is just amazing that it's that simple to yeah. make that big of a difference. The other thing is when kids were pulled, they said that they would rather have a consistent family dinner than go on family vacation. Yeah. So even if kids don't know how to express that, yeah, it's a really important. Yeah. I thought that was a standout thing. Like the fact that kids would rather have dinner around the table with a mom and dad who are present. Right. Not distracted. Not distracted. I think that's key because yeah. you could all be at the same table and not be together. That's another story for another day, which sets up practice number two. Practice number two is no phone zone. What does that mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Dinner, especially no yeah. screens, no screens, no TVs, no, no TVs. phones, no phones, no screens, but also other times outside of dinner. So we try when we get home from work, put our phones away and be present, yeah. whether that's making dinner. Yeah. Whatever. And I, I think that's important because especially for those of you parents who have younger kids, it's so easy to be distracted by your device mm -hmm. and your kid is taking cues and patterns from you. Um, and so if they feel like they're always competing with whatever is on your phone and you're looking, you're spending more time, if your phone is getting more eye contact than your kid when you're home, mm -hmm. I would challenge you to think about that. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Easier said than done. Though. Yeah. Uh, again, sure. we're, we're not perfect in this, but we continue to learn. Um, number three, here we go. Practice number three and we're doing okay. Uh, consistent dates with them. Right. Yeah. So one-on-one -on -one dates. Yeah. Really special. Why don't you share? You're so good at this. Share oh, what you've done. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. yeah. So when, when the boys were little, uh, we didn't call them dates. Uh, we called them man ventures because mm -hmm. I'm taking the men on an adventure. So we called it man venture. Um, and we would go out and we would like explore the woods. I remember one time we were up at Flaming Geyser State Park up in Maple Valley, Auburn, wherever that's at. And uh, we just decided like, hey, let's jump in the river. And I mean, the boys were probably first, second grade, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so just like exploring and doing things. As they've gotten older, it shifted where uh, myself and my boys different times we'll go out just for coffee together. Um, now, like there's a pivot that has taken place as they become older and what those conversations look like. Uh, but as well with, with faith, um, it's daddy daughter date. Yeah. And that usually involves a donut and coffee. Yeah. She loves donuts. Yeah. Um, she's such a sweet little girl. But she is. yeah, one-on-one -on -one dates, uh, really important. And by the way, parents, that's a really easy way, especially if you have multiple kids to give some focused attention to yeah. your Even children. Even if you're taking just one of them on an errand that they may not enjoy, but if it's with you and you do something oh, special, yeah. like just go to McDonald's and get a dollar soda yeah. for them, you know, something yeah. to make it special. Yeah. Ice cream sundae. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, that, I remember us getting that advice when we were maybe really young parents actually, somebody said, bring other people into the things that you're already doing. Right. And I think kids are a great, great example of that. Uh, and that's a great segue into number four. Here we go. Bring them into your world. Bring yeah. them into your world. What does that yeah. mean? Well, there's so many things that on the weekend we may have committed to that if we can look for ways to include our kids. So let's say we're serving, we're volunteering. How can our kids get involved with us? Yeah. I know in ministry, why don't you talk about ministry? Yeah, I, I think early on we decided that as pastors, because that's what you and I are, that's what we've done uh, our entire marriage. Um, we decided early on that that ministry and life would not be in competition. And I know there's a tension for a lot of people in this area of like, 
well, you know, we, we got to have, you know, work life balance. And I agree with all of that. I think we're huge advocates for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but when our kids were little, we wanted to bring them in to what we were doing so that it wasn't ministry that was taking mom and dad away. So one example, I remember when the boys were super young, uh, when it was appropriate, I would take them to like the hospital with me to visit somebody and pray with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, I would take them, uh, if I was speaking a weekend camp or whatever, they would come with me even when they were young. And so it wasn't that ministry was taking dad away. It was, this is something we get to do together. And I know not everybody listening, their vocation would allow those things. But I would say if you have an activity, if you have a hobby, um, maybe you enjoy golfing, Figure out how to involve your kids when they're little with you. And I know that maybe sounds like, well, Tyler, that's the one area in my life where I feel like I get space. But again, pulling kids into who you are and what you do is going to create a lasting, lasting impact. Uh, So bring them into your world. Number five, engage in spiritual conversations and practices. Yeah. Starts as simple as maybe at bedtime reading from the Jesus storybook Bible together. Yeah. Talking about it. Yeah. Praying at night. Yeah. We, we had a rhythm simple. when the kids were real little, we got a hold of, and we still give this away every time we do a baby dedication we do. to this day. Yeah. Uh, so a friend gave us the Jesus storybook Bible. We'd read a story out of it every night and it just became this rhythm where we found ourselves having a practice of spiritual conversations. So it's not just, okay, mom and dad, preach messages from stage therefore like that's what this looks like we tried to make christianity and us following jesus practical and real lived out in front of them Mm -hmm. in the house not just what they saw on the walls of the church Um, so for those of you who aren't in vocational ministry um, you might not be a pastor you might not even be a small group leader but i want to encourage you don't disqualify yourself from having spiritual conversations with your kids It's not about how much you know. It's about letting them see an authentic faith lived out from your life. But my other encouragement, start young. Start young with that. Uh, Number six, here we go. We're moving pretty quick. Number six, teach your kids about finances. Teach your kids about finances. This is huge because here's, here's what I want to remind every parent. Someone is going to teach your kids about money. I would recommend that it be you and not the credit card company that they encounter their freshman year of college. Yeah. Okay, so talk to us about what what were some of the things that we did practically in this area? Yeah, it was important to us to teach our kids to give and to save from the earliest possible age. So we literally, they would get a dollar allowance. We would get 10 dimes. Big spenders. It was the most tedious thing to get rolls of dimes and count them out. Yeah. But we wanted them to learn to save a dime, give a dime, and they could spend the other 80 cents. So that, as soon as they were able to earn a commission, that's yep. how we started, and we still oh, yeah. talk Un- about it. Unpack that really quick, because you, you just made an important point. Our kids received commissions, not right. allowance. Yeah, just something we learned from Dave Ramsey. Um, so they're not entitled to get money just because they're yeah. humans and yeah. in our family. Just because you show up in my house every day, that doesn't grant you the right to like receive money. Right. That sounds really harsh. I know some of you are like, Tyler, you are heartless. But that entitlement grows in life. And so we wanted to teach our kids that income is a reward for work right. done. And yeah. so uh, it was just a principle that we, we learned. Yeah. Yeah. Number seven, last but not least, Lay your hand on them and pray for them every day. Of the practices, I think this one is my favorite um, because we, we started this when, when they were young, when they were still in their crib. We would take time, we'd put our hand on them and we'd pray for them. And to this day, our kids, even if it's late, they'll still like come in our bedroom or whatever and they're like, hey, good night. And you can tell they're, they're kind of wanting yeah. that interaction, yeah. that that touch. And um, talk about the the spiritual significance, though, of actually like placing your hand on your kid and praying out loud for them. Well, it just creates it's so special. It creates um, a practice that they get used to. It's scriptural. Yeah. It um, you're speaking blessing over them, yeah. and they know that they yeah. know 
Yeah. I think it's just so good that that physical touch, that reinforcement that you are present, you're with them, um, that you actually have. And it's not about, it's not about you having these like eloquent words. I know some people, they get kind of nervous. Like, I don't, I don't really pray out loud. Um, just, just start and do yeah. it little by little. But I would, I would encourage you do that every single day. All right. So we did those seven here. We, here, here they are once again, family party night. Number one, no phone zone. Number two, consistent dates with them. Number four was bring them into your world. Five, engage in spiritual conversations. Six, teach your kids about finances. And then seven, lay your hand on them and pray for them every day. Um, One of the things that we did in preparation for this podcast today is we sent some messages out via social media like, hey, let us know your questions and we'll try to tackle some of them. Um, you know, it, it was, I had to laugh a little bit because you had like 8 billion questions. I had like two. Um, so people want to hear from you. So I'm going to play the role of asking Amber questions and then we'll listen to, uh, those responses. But honestly, we'll just dialogue through these. And I would say if you have any other questions for Amber or myself, you can submit those again at podcast at lifecenter.com. And we'll try to answer those on a future episode, maybe not even about parenting, but about building strong your life, even in the area of your faith. Okay. So first category, here we go. Methods of parenting. What would you say are the differences in parenting styles between the two of you? Oh man. Oh, I like this. I can't wait to hear what you say. Well, here's a little tidbit or tit tidbit tidbit for pre-marriage. Okay? If you're not married yet, you need to talk about this in pre-marriage counseling because you need to present yourselves on the same page to your family, right? Yeah. To your children. Yeah. So whether we agree or disagree, we have to be united. There's a unified front. That's right. Yeah. With the kids. Yeah. It's very important. So what are our biggest differences? I think that um, I think the quote that a mom's role is to protect her children and a dad's role is to prepare Oh, full His on. children is, it just shows up every day full in on. how we parent. Yeah. I'm totally like, I'm the dad who's looked at each of our kids and said, listen, someday you are going to grow up and move out. And when you do, that woman's still going to be in love with me. Just kind of drawing the boundaries of like, you know, you got to understand. And I don't get me wrong. I don't think I'm like, you know, drill sergeant or anything like that. I, I have compassion, um, but I'm trying to prepare adults and I would, yeah, I, I would say you tend to be a little bit more protective. I'm maybe a little bit more of like, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll kind of figure it out. Um, let them, let them take some risks. Uh, yeah. they're going to learn by, by making mistakes, but not becoming so permissive that we inadvertently allow our kids to injure themselves. So I think there's, right. there's a tension to be managed right. there. Um, that's, that's a fun question. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, next section, parenting young kids. Okay, so right. we got to rewind the tape a little bit, not that long. Um, what is your number one piece of advice for a first-time dad? And same thing, a first-time mom. I'll let you go. First-time mom. First-time mom. Number one piece of advice. Yep, you have to have grace for yourself. So it's not going to... Life is not going to ever be the same as it was before you were a mom. So you just have to have grace for um, prioritizing what is most important. That is to take care of yourself, take care of your child, yeah. and then invest in your relationship. And the other things are not the most important. Yeah. So lean into help as you can and have grace. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that was going to be my thing that I said. So in addition to that, I would say to the first time dads listening, understand the season you're in. Um, when Amber gave birth to our first, I had all these expectations of what it was going to be like to like be a dad. And, you know, I'm picturing like playing catch and, you know, running in the park and doing all this stuff. And then I realized, Oh, like the first 18 months, are not about me like at all. I'm just there to like, I play in the backdrop. I support, I help. Um, like those first 18 months are different, but then 
kind of at that 18 month part mark would you say 18 months maybe 24 months yeah um there was a pivot where my role became even more significant you know as that as that dad engaging with the kids because the first few months just spoiler alert for some dads everything is about the baby and mama it just it is what it is hopefully that's helpful um Another question, I've heard mixed points of view of sleepovers. So in your perspective, is it age-driven or just a hard yes or no? I love this question. Yes, such a good question. For our family, age-driven, it was years, years and years before we let any of our children actually sleep over at anyone's house. Even people that like I know and like super comfortable with um it definitely was age yeah um they had to be uh somewhat like self-reliant able to know how to get themselves out of situations etc so making sure that they were mature yeah um just because you you never know yep you never know yeah yeah so definitely definitely age um and I, i would say don't don't be apologetic about that as a parent um, you have a responsibility to protect and guard your children. Um, and so even if everybody else is doing it, if you don't have a piece about it, like there's a powerful word. No. Yeah. And sometimes that means picking your kids up at a birthday party at 10 at right. night, which would be way more convenient just to let them spend the night. But just making those sacrifices is important. Yeah. Yeah. What are ways to prioritize your spouse when it seems like you're drowning in the midst of newborn life? Yeah. Yeah. So good question. How, how can you better prioritize me, Amber, in the midst of drowning? No. Okay. Obviously, that question is for me. Uh, that was a joke, by the way, everybody. Um, man, prioritizing your spouse. I, I think this comes back to, um, especially for dads as husbands uh you know scripture says love your wives as christ loved the church he gave himself for her and so there's going to be a level of self-sacrifice it's not about us it's not about our comfort it's not about our convenience it's about being willing to step in how can i serve how can i lift off burdens Um, and so maybe you had a certain rhythm before kids well, guess what? The rhythms are going to change and you might have to pick up some things that you're not used to picking up. Um, so I can think of, uh, you know, the way that I would engage in helping to prepare meals or being available to you. So you could, you know, if you wanted to get out, cause you needed to get out at times, especially when we had infants, you need to just get out and take a breath of fresh air. And so I was, you know, yeah. kind of there trying to, trying to be dad and not freak out by myself um, as I'm looking at this beautiful new newborn and going, okay, don't mess up, Tyler, don't mess up. Yeah. Um, so figuring that out, anything yeah. you would add? I think for the mom, the first six weeks, again, have grace for yourself. Your yeah, body good. is healing. You have different emotions and hormones, so have grace for yourself. But I would say as soon as you're able, um, just find little ways to show your husband that you still care about him, that he's still important, yeah. that the baby isn't taking his place. It's just a season yeah. um, where your attention and your lack of sleep um, is due to the baby yeah. and it's a season. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Let each other take a nap. Like if, if they're stressed or emotional or whatever, like let each other take a nap, find ways to just, again, lift the burdens. Um, yeah. uh, Another category here. So these are questions when it comes to parenting multiple kids, parenting multiple kids. Um, And the funny thing about this, by the way, I remember before we had kids, I used to look at people, you know, when they had kids, I'm like, oh, you act like this is so hard and oh, it's not that big of a deal. And then, you know, when we were kind of early on, everybody wanted to, to give us advice. And, you know, there's so many voices and so many thoughts and ideas. And I would say be purposeful with the voices you allow to speak into what's going on. So um, on that note, parenting multiple kids, how do you guys spend quality time with each child one on one? 
Yeah, we hit that a little bit. I think yeah, trying to yep, take them on a little date if possible, take them on an errand if possible. During nap time, you can invest in maybe an older one um, if a younger one is sleeping. So just finding rhythm that you're currently in and yeah. making the most of it. Yeah, and I, I would say pay attention to what your child's love language is because right. um, they're not all gonna be the same. One of your kids might need quality time and if you have a quality time kid, you really need to pay attention to that because um, they notice that one-on-one -on -one time with you. If they're words of affirmation, like make sure you're generous in praise and encouragement with your words. Um, so, so figuring that out um, is so very important. What about this? Where, where is your favorite place to go as a family? So multiple kids, where's our favorite place to go? Why don't you give a couple thoughts when our kids were little and now as they're a little bit older? Yeah. Wow. I would say something. We would go to the zoo a lot when our kids a were little. Lot. We would pack a lunch and get a family we actually, membership We actually to got the a zoo. zoo pass from like Topeka, Kansas or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Years ago. Years was ago. Was a sister. It was a sister organization to some zoo. of the zoos. And like that was, that was awesome. So we, we would literally go to the zoo like once a week. Yeah. I had that place memorized. Yeah. And our boys loved it. Yeah. Faith was like an infant. Yeah. But yeah. So great exercise. Yeah. You're outside. You're Pack outside. Pack a lunch. It's cold. Bundle yeah. up. Yeah. It's all good. What about yeah. now that they're older? So we try to find, let's see, what do we do? We like to ski as a family. Amen. One of our favorite things lately, we like to paddleboard, paddleboard. as a family. So we'll pack a lunch, paddleboard yeah. to a little island. Yeah. So I think yeah. just what you can do that yeah. is not in front of a screen, um, almost anything, yeah. right? Not in front of a as, screen. As your kids get time. older, we'll, we'll go on walks and like all three of our kids will actually want to go walk with us, which I know sounds crazy, but they do. Um, and... What's fun, as you get older, I think your options change and increase because you can yeah. do activities outdoors and things that you love. That's just, it's very hard and challenging to do when they're a little bit younger. So again, find stuff that you love to do, pull them into it. Um, here's some questions that came in about parenting girls in mm -hmm. particular, parenting mm -hmm. girls. Um, so what are some ways to raise strong, confident girls? Mm, so good. I think having a good relationship with their dad is one of the most important ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, that sense of security and identity is so important. Yeah. yeah. And I think speaking more to than to just their looks. Yeah. So tell them they have a kind heart and yeah. and speaking about attributes. Yeah. Um, Call out the virtues that mm -hmm. you want to see uh, grow in their lives. Um, yeah. Be careful with criticism um avoid criticism that doesn't mean you don't bring correction but anytime right. you have to bring correction to a child so, so here's a principle this isn't just about parenting girls but let's say you have to discipline one of your kids we've had to discipline each of our kids different times when they were little when they were a little bit older and even now each one of those moments the discipline looked a little bit different but no matter what the discipline was we always stayed present with them mm -hmm. and like would hug them. We would pray together so that they understood the punishment is not separation from us. This, this discipline is to help correct or transform the path that you're kind of walking down. Yeah, yeah. that's so, good. Um, let's see here. Girls look to dads as the example for a future spouse. Tips. Oh, this is a great question. Um, I believe this one was from JB Wilson, but uh, the tips that I would recommend would be to understand, yes, they are watching you. They're taking their cues from how a man should treat a woman. And so with my daughter early on, um, and this is so ingrained in her now, but like I told her boys should open the door for girls. Now that might sound old fashioned or whatever, but to me, I'm trying to teach her to look for a man who will honor her because if he's unwilling to hold the door for her, he's going to probably be unwilling to get 
uncomfortable or sacrifice some of his own desires for her. Um, so to this day, she will stand outside of the car door and she'll do this with her brothers. We're still, they're, they're still a work in progress because they won't always, they won't always get the door for her, but um, she'll stand outside the door until I open the car door for her. And every time she does that, I look at her and I say, thank you. Cause I'm trying to reinforce you're looking for a man who will honor you and cherish you. Um, I try to be an example in helping with dishes and helping around the house and doing chores and uh, taking care of, you know, like the other day I, I was out in the driveway washing your car and um, trying to show this is what a man looks like. This is what a man should do um, in the midst of a family and being, yeah. being a hard worker, like showing up yeah. and, uh, and being present. Um, any good ideas for a fun dad daughter date? Oh man, I, I think you can't go wrong with donuts or like going out for coffee. I don't, do they still have the American Girl doll store? Not in Washington. Yeah, so like when Faith was little for one of her uh, birthdays, we drove up to Alderwood. Where was that at? Somewhere up north uh, to the American Girl do- doll store. American Girl doll store. Um, we had like little sandwiches and tea and then we got a doll. So, uh, I don't know, do girly things, go get a pedicure or manicure together. There you go. What else? Or do it at home. Yeah. Do it at home. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Do it at home. Uh, let's transition. Let's, let's tackle some tough situations. You ready for this? Yes. How do you address, uh, depression and anxiety with teens or support your kids, friends who have it? This is such a good question. By the way, many parents probably are aware, but depression, anxiety are at a all time high. I read a stat a number of years ago that talked about the the amount of anxiety that teenagers live with today would be parallel to what a uh, psychiatric patient experienced in the 1950s. Yeah. And so like, think about that dynamic. I think a lot of this has to do with social media, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, But how do you address depression and anxiety with teens and help be a support for their friends? So good. Well, you need to be a safe place um, to talk with your kids. Let them know that you care, that you want to hear. Some of the things we said before is screens will make it worse. Yeah. Um, family time, family dinners will decrease the likelihood of depression, yeah. anxiety. Yeah. So really spending your family time um, doing what's important, yeah. doing so what good. matters. Yeah, I know when when each of our kids were little, I gave them kind of what I, what I called like a secret signal, right? Where all they have to do is walk up to me and touch me on the arm and say, dad, can we go for a drive? And I know exactly what that means. So this started when they were kind of elementary school. And I just told them, if you ever are in a place where you need to process, you need to talk, you're going through something, you don't have to tell me what it is in that moment. But all you got to do is touch me on the arm and say, Dad, can we go for a drive? It's been cool because our kids have taken me up on that different times. And it could be 11 o'clock at night. And okay, we're going to jump in the car. We're going to go for a drive, but I want them to know and understand that they can approach us with anything. And, um, and even talking about mental health, like we have to guard our mental health. And so I know we talk about the importance of like being outside and going and doing things and not just spending your life in front of a TV screen or computer screen. Um, and so in those conversations and kind of the consistency of that, I think it's, it's helped with Mm -hmm. our kids and then, you know, encouraging our, our kids with some of their friends who have walked through challenges, you know, in, in their mental health, their anxiety, their depression, reminding them you can be a source of encouragement, of hope, of joy, like keep stepping into that space and loving and encouraging, uh, your friends. Uh, this one came in from Jillian Hartman. Um, how do you help older kids navigate big changes such as a new city and new school making new friends? So we experienced this when we moved to Tacoma in 2015, it was a big change, especially for Judah. Um, he's our oldest, he's our firstborn. He went from a school that he loved. He's now at a school that he loves, but, um, there, there was a big change there. So what, what would you encourage parents with? 
you know, as cliche as it sounds, I think the most important thing is bathe it in prayer. Yeah. We specifically prayed for Judah, like, Lord, bring him good friends. And it was a prayer that um, we were consistent with and we've seen the fruit of it finally. But because he is less social than the other two, it was a bigger challenge for him to get those close friendships. Yeah. Um, and then what do you have to say? Yeah. What else? Well, I would just say so much of this comes back to what we project. Mm. And so try to try to make sure that you're praying through your own emotions about a big change. Yeah. Because let's say, let's say your spouse, your, your family's relocating because your spouse took a new job and you kind of have to, but you're the other spouse who's like kind of along for the ride, just like the kids are along for the ride, so to speak. I think if you have like negativity, if you're like like always kind of murmuring about it, your kids will pick up and what we do in moderation, they often will do in excess. Right. So like if we are faith filled and like, hey, this, this is a new season, it doesn't mean it's not going to come with challenges, but I would encourage parents always look for the opportunity and don't just point out the obstacles. So kind of yeah. like what you were saying with Judah, like, hey, you're going to meet some new friends. And like mm-hmm. some of these people are going to be people that you grow up with and spend the rest of your life with. And so um, that would be some some encouragement for that. Uh, Noel sent in this question. When you as parents don't agree, how do you find agreement or come to a compromise? Oh, this is so good. Ooh, so oh, good. Good. Again, I would say have those conversations privately, not in front yeah, of your children. Yeah, please don't don't discuss this. To start, in front of kids. Um, that is important to even kids feeling safe and yeah. uh, their own well being. Uh, is their parents not to be arguing in front of them? I would say, for us, yeah, we talk about what's most important. What's the yeah. outcome? We come that back we to our values. Yeah, and what's most important? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say there too, you mentioned this earlier, but having a unified front, because if not, if, if one parent becomes the permissive parent and other, the other parents, like always the, the disciplined parent, like you'll watch your kids begin to do end arounds where parent a said no. And so even though they said no, they go over to parent B who says, well, of course you can. They're, they're basically trying to get you to, to pit against each other, basically to fight against each other. And so, uh, being unified in those decisions and communicate about it. Hey, I made this decision. Here's why. And then working through that to make sure you're, you're in alignment, uh, with that. I think it all comes down to communication as Mm -hmm. parents, as, as couples. And so as parents, a lot of times Amber and I will talk about things together. So our kids know this rule, right? Um, we've had these moments where our kids will run up to us after school and their friend is with them and they'll say, Hey, so-and-so invited me. Can I go? And we instituted a rule after a few times of this, which is what, what's our rule? If they ask in front of their friend, the question will always be no, not this time. Yeah. The answer will always be no. Yeah. 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 Yes. And that's because it gives the parent no place to discuss maybe other things that we had planned or whatever. And so our kids have learned the hard way. Like you don't ask us that in front of your friend. It needs to be a discussion as a family. And that way too, you're not under the gun as a parent to try to answer like in the moment. Or say yes to a situation you might um, not feel good about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tech and social media. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And we're, we're in the home stretch, ladies and gentlemen, just a few more questions we're going to walk through. But, uh, Lindsay Cooper sent this question in, do your teens have social media and how do you as parents navigate social media in today's culture? Okay. So let me jump in for a second because I spent a lot of years as a youth pastor working in student ministry And that was really at the onset and the rise. Come on, I know some of our listeners, you remember MySpace. Some of you, you probably still have a MySpace. But uh, the rise of MySpace, then Facebook, then Instagram. And there was a pivot when it went from those things being something on your computer that you had to log on to, to now living in your pocket that you're consistently connected to. And so we made the decision that our kids are not going to have social media. Um, And with that said, 
I am a stickler on parental controls. Our kids' devices are so locked down. Not, not again, not in a militant way, but I just want to safeguard our kids because there's certain things that once you experience it, you can't undo it. And so having that wisdom and that perspective, I think is important. Um, there will be pressure that your children will feel depending, no matter what decision you make, because I've seen kids way too young, like on Instagram, like their parents just let them have Instagram accounts and there's no safety. There's no, you know, kind of mechanism to, to control the amount of time they're spending. And so for us, we just felt like it was a big value, um, to kind of lock those things down. Now, some of you who are listening, um, maybe you're friends with us on social media. I do have accounts for each of my kids. And the reason I did that, I wanted to secure their names for them when they come to the right age so that then they can basically access their name that's been set aside for them. But until that point, we've kind of said a no. The one exception to this would be be real. So recently, uh, each of our kids, you know, stepped into that space, but there's very clear ground rules. They can only be friends with people they actually know. They have to be friends with mom and dad, which they absolutely love. And, uh, you know, basically there's, there's a bunch of guidelines and, uh, stuff that we put in place. Anything yeah, else you would well say to that? Said. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, another question, how do you embrace technology with boundaries that aren't overbearing? Um, I would just say this, no matter what boundary you draw, your preteen or teen is going to feel like it's overbearing. Yeah. Okay, let me say that again. No matter what boundary you draw, your child will look at that and say, you are so overbearing, you are so strict, you are so this, you are so that. Um, but that's where you have to be in alignment as parents. And I would encourage you, once you set a line, don't budge. Because again, once it's out of the jar, it's hard to get it back in. And so be clear on what you value. And I'm not saying that my way, Amber, Amber in my way is the right way. That's what we've chosen in alignment for our values, what we care about, um, what, what we find as healthy in the season that we're in right now. Um, but I would just say like limit screen time. We have a rule in our house um, that all homework has to be done ahead of time. There's a number of things before screen time that they have to do. What, what are yeah, they? Yeah, their chores, their homework. The summertime, it's reading. They have to read before. Yeah, so they have to they have to read like an actual book. Right. So Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, play outside. Yeah, play outside, like do something. They have to do that before they have screen time. And then we've defined a specific amount of screen time that they get each day. And so their phones are set up with this. Um, we set an age that our kids received phones at, it was much later than many of their peers, but even when they received them, part of that was, uh, we don't have a home phone. And so we needed to be able to get a hold of them. But now as activities increase, being able to, you know, for them to communicate with us, but us to communicate with them, I think is, is important. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Last question. You ready for this? Yes. I love this, this is from Alicia. She said this, how do you, and this is specifically for families in ministry. So any pastors uh, listening, ministry families listening, uh, this is for you. How do you keep your kids from becoming burnt out on church? How do you keep them excited about their faith or having zeal for God? And how has this maybe looked different depending on your kids' ages and stages of life? I think this is such a great question. Yeah, such yeah. a good question. Go for it. Yeah, and I think it's something we're always wrestling through as um, parents, like how much is too much, um, how much is legalism. But I would say as kids, include them as much as you can because when they're little, it's usually a fun thing yeah. to be with mom and dad. As they get older, um, the things that are most important, like church on Sunday for our kids, never an option. Like they're going to be at church on Sunday. Um, and the other things you can wrestle through what's yeah. most important yeah yeah um so again I, I i mentioned this earlier but don't make ministry an enemy of day-to-day -day life um i think kids will pick up on our tone 
Mm-hmm. So if you're like, oh, we got to go to church again. Like if you were saying that as you and the kids were getting in the car, like they're going to they're gonna pick that up and that's going to become their perspective. Right. And so I think how we shape and frame things. And, and if you want your kids to have a zealous relationship with Jesus, how's your zeal doing? Mm-hmm. Do they hear you talk about it or do they see you model it? Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, like laying a hand on them, praying for them. When you pray, do you pray with passion and authority? Yeah. Like, are you calling the best out of them? Yeah. Um, I I think the greatest hindrance that I've seen for families and ministry is when the kid feels like there's a disconnect between like stage dad and dad at home or stage mom and mom at home or like church mom and mom at home. Like we need to have like authenticity, which is I know a huge value for you. That's like your number one thing. Um, If it's not real, then your kids are gonna pick up on that. Yeah. And if if you are always feeling like it's a burden and not a blessing to grow your family in the church and like, man, God has called us. and, And that was always our conversation, whether we were moving to a new role, stepping into a new assignment, doing... We, we would talk about how God has called our family to this. Yeah. This isn't just like ministry taking dad away or ministry taking mom away, but this is something that Jesus is inviting our family into. Yeah, and I think talking about the why. So yeah. the why do we do this? Why do we, why do we go to prayer when there's a special prayer night? Yeah. You know, those sorts of things so that um, there's dial- there's opportunity for the kids to dialogue yeah, with us. Yeah. And I would say, especially as they get older, allow them to ask questions. Like, yeah. do I have to go to this? And those, those have been like really, it's turned out to be good conversations. Yeah. Um, but I know for me, so I, I didn't grow up in a ministry home, but I grew up in a family that like every time the church doors were open, we were there. And here's what's crazy. Like I never, I never like kicked against it. I didn't think it was because my parents were joyful about it. Mm -hmm. My parents were like, this is just who we are. This is what we do. And that, that model, because again, kids pick up not just on what you say, but what your attitude says, what your eye rolls say or don't say like the little, like they, they hear, they feel, they pick up those things. And so how we approach this, like if you're not zealous, like where, where are they going to find that zeal? If you're not excited to, man, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, you know, quoting Psalms. If, if you don't have that joy or that gladness, let God cultivate that in you so that it's, it's a blessing and not just a burden. Yeah. So good stuff. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, a few takeaways from today's episode. Uh, one, we want to encourage you to parent on purpose. So it'll be done either by design or by default. So be purposeful. We talked about a number of ways to do that. Another thing we would recommend is don't parent alone. So you may be listening, you're a single parent. Uh, you may be listening and you're a, a couple that you know has a brand new kid. Don't parent alone. In other words, plug into community. There's there's a number of things we have right here at Life Center. LC Kids, man, every time we meet, there's opportunity for LC Kids. There's this thing called MOPS, Mothers yeah. of Preschoolers, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And that meets uh, here at Life Center. We also have build night classes that happen in different seasons throughout the year where there's something for each and every age range. And uh, this last season of build night, we taught a class, The Art of Parenting, that was super helpful for parents who are trying to navigate and find handles. So there's, there's no lack of opportunity. You don't have to do this alone. The last thought that I think Amber and I, we want to encourage you with is don't give up. Yep. Be right. encouraged. Give grace to yourself. Jesus has grace for you. Um, it's worth it. That's it's right. totally, totally worth it. Uh, so again, hopefully that was helpful. The conversation around being purposeful in our parenting. As I said earlier, if you have questions about anything you've heard on today's podcast, be sure to send us a question or an email at podcast at lifecenter.com. And don't forget, while you're listening to this, be sure to rate the podcast, leave a review either on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening today. And as always, you can find us on Instagram 
at Tyler Soley, at Amber Soley. We hang out there from time to time. Thanks so much for listening to the Build Strong podcast. We will see you next month.